welcome back to the podcast. This is going to be a fun episode because it's it's breaking the boundary of the two of us, which is going to be interesting and give people an idea of where the show is going to go. And so I would love it, Randall, if you would introduce who we have on the show this week. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, so this week we have Harlan Brum from Autodesk, uh, who a lot of people may know is the man that uh, sits and is in control of what's going on inside of Revit. And uh, so we've got Harlan on the episode and uh, Paul Aubin, who a lot of you may know as well. Uh, Paul is kind of famous for his, on the education side, on the Revit side, he does lots of training and a lot of people have been introduced to Paul from that standpoint. Um, what's kind of fun is that this conversation is going to be about the new sample project that ships with Revit 2024. Um, so you'll get to hear a little bit of the backstory of, uh, of how that project came about. Um, it's more than a decade since that was updated. So I think it's uh, a lot of us that, that end up using those sample projects, especially to demo with, are it's a welcome uh, introduction to, to a better sample project. Um, but what's interesting about this conversation is that uh, basically Autodesk outsourced and ran this like a real project. And Paul uh, was the kind of lead, uh, project lead on that and pulled together the team that ended up building that. So we get to hear the entire backstory about how all that came about. Uh, so it's a, a fun episode. I just think about how many conference rooms or, you know, auditoriums I've sat in for Autodesk University or people, consultants coming into the office to talk about what they're working on and pulling up the, the commercial the sample sample house project. Yeah. yeah, was, yeah. There's either or the, worse house, the house. Right? <laughs> or, or, yeah. And it's so funny because nobody who who builds tools for Revit builds their own Revit projects. Right. And so everybody's right. using those projects and it's like, it's so funny as an architect to just watch those projects show up time and time again. So this really has been a long time coming. And I think what, what you mentioned it, that, that Paul ran this like as the project manager and brought in other disciplines. So it really is a true multidisciplinary project. If people haven't seen it, you're going to see it here in this show. And then I, I hope you'll go check it out after this if you haven't opened it up because there's a lot of things in there. And we kind of get into what it took to make the project, but then also just some of the outcomes, I think, that are really interesting. And as people who use Revit are always looking for how to make something. And I think this project also has some of that kind of stuff in it as well. It's like you can actually go in there and it's not just a super generic project, right? I mean, it was... No, it was a real it, site, uh, a yep. real site, a real project. It, it, not a real project in that it was going to ever be built, but it was, right. it was treated as if it, if it was and uh, kind of pulled together. And I think, I think you'll hear them say it was like a 10 month process, right. To, to run. So it was, they yeah. tried to run as kind of close to a real, uh, kind of project as they could to pull this together. So, uh, yeah, really, uh, interesting. Uh, 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 I think, uh, everybody will enjoy getting to hear the backstory about this. Yeah. And that process that they went through, uh, as you say, it is a, it was a quote unquote real project and it went as so far as it's not going to be built, but it kind of ticks a lot of boxes. So I, the story behind it is very cool, which is what this podcast is kind of about. It's about the, the director's commentary behind the scenes of what people won't just see right off the surface when they open up this project. So I hope everybody enjoys it. Anyway, um, we enjoyed the conversation, and so I hope I hope you do too. And uh, that's it. Okay, let's get Great. into it. Let's go. Welcome, Harlan and Paul. Uh, you know, I reached out um, as we've kicked off this podcast series, kind of the behind-the-scenes look of uh, how, you know, software is developed and projects are coming about in this side of the world. Uh, one of the top of my list recently was to reach out to Paul and Harlan to talk about the long awaited update to the Revit sample project. So hopefully what we're going to, what we're going to dig into is the kind of backstory background on how this came about. Um, you know, I, from a, uh, I've joked around, um, you know, being in the software side of the business we use and doing a lot around Revit, we, we use those sample projects all the time. And after using the same one for years and years and years, it was like, oh, Finally, we get, you know, a, one, a heftier project and something uh, new. So this is uh, near and dear to our heart because of what we do. And uh, we're looking forward to digging into this. So um, I know you guys did, um, 
you know, you've presented this uh, at Bill this uh, a couple of months ago, did a session on that. And uh, so I knew that you all were thinking about it and thought it was interesting enough to be able to put one of those sessions together. But uh, either Paul or Harlan, maybe one of you can uh, uh, give one brief introduction of yourselves and I'll let you guys kind of kick it off. All right. Well, yeah, Harlan and I have known each other for years. I'm not even sure. I think we met way back when Harlan was still in product support at Autodesk. So uh, for anybody who remembers calling product support <laughs> and getting Harlan, you know how far back that goes. Um but uh, we've uh, we've developed a friendship over the years and a, a partnership over the years, and we've worked together in a few different uh, cases. But uh, as you uh, oh, and first of all, thanks very much for inviting us um, uh, on the uh, podcast here today. But um, you know, as you said, I've done a, a lot of Revit uh, training and consulting over the years, and that's kind of the primary part of my business. Um, but I primarily work uh, with architectural firms using Revit, and uh, LinkedIn Learning is my big platform for training, but I also work directly with uh, architectural firms. So, uh, and then uh, Harlan, uh, you can go ahead, add what you want to add. And then I guess maybe you can kick off how we got started together working on the yeah, same sure. project. So um, originally I come from the industry. Um, I was with some small firms in the Midwest in the United States. And then in, I think like December, 2006, Quite a while ago, I joined Autodesk in the product support organization. I spent about eight years there. Uh, and then so the last nine years I've spent in the product team. So basically responsible for Revit architecture and working with architects. And in the last year, I switched over to work on kind of what we call our Revit core capabilities, which is everything I like to joke, not discipline specific. So anything that's like shared across everybody. So don't talk to me about structure any <laughs> or MP. <laughs> no clue. And nowadays I get to say, don't talk to me about architecture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's always where I came from in my background. So um, like I said, I've been with Autodesk about almost 17 years now. I'm um, doing a lot of different things. Uh, so basically, if if <laughs> for the last eight or nine years, if something you don't like, uh, probably you can point at me and say like, oh, that was Harlan responsible for doing that. Or if you like something, maybe if it's, again, if it's not structure or MEP related, yeah, I probably have my fingerprints on it. Well, you weren't, you weren't directly responsible, but the, you ended up here in the brunt. Yeah. Of yeah. And most of the time, <laughs> obviously work with a really talented team who, you know, does all the actual work. I like to joke that I create PowerPoint slides more than anything, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the sample model. So, Actually, this story goes back even farther than what I think I talked to Paul about originally. So probably five or six years ago, we uh, we had some requests um, specifically in our German market to do a better job positioning the product in Germany and in the Dock region, so like Switzerland, Germany. Um, and the way we started to do that work was we decided like we didn't have a good way to demo the product and basically talk about it. So we invested in a new sample model and new content. Um, that project actually is available in Revit. You can go look at it. Um, and that was the starting point when we decided like, hey, this actually is, can be successful. It can actually help people learn. These models um, need to get better. They need to get more complex. But, um, and actually at the very top, you see those, those golden nugget projects. There you go. Um, and then, so we also did the same thing with Japan a couple of years later. Um, and we were kind of waiting, I was kind of waiting to see on the architecture side because, uh, you know, our, most of our customers are, are us <laughs> and English speaking. Um, and we know that those models they hadn't been touched in a long time and there was a lot we wanted to be able to cover with them. Um, so I think, uh, not long after trying to think of when we actually started, that's Paul, but like it was 23 was out. It had been out for a little while, not that long. Um, and I, well, I think we started talking about it even in 22, but we didn't actually start working on it until 23 yeah, was out. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, uh, well, we had their initial discussion probably at an Autodesk university at one point, or maybe over a phone call or something. I mean, it was definitely before we, and I, several months went by before we, before you called me back and said, Hey, I think we're doing this thing. Exactly. You know? <laughs> so, so you guys probably you know, yeah. trying to you know, navigate all that and make sure that we can, um, get the right people involved and have the support we need. It's not, it wasn't a small undertaking. So getting that to happen and then reaching out to Paul. And I knew, you know, pretty early on that I wanted Paul involved um, because what we found is that uh, hiring somebody who understands that particular market really well was super critical. 
Um, so in Germany, we hired local contractors as well. And same thing in Japan, we worked with a Japanese company to be able to do those samples. And I wanted, really thought it was going to be important that we have somebody who, you know, if this is a US-based project that actually knows how these things get put together in a real way and that we can rely on. Um, and that's a huge part of this is, you know, with, with Revit stuff, in particular, these sample models, there's a lot of deadlines. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of chaos that can consume everybody's time. So we wanted to make sure, you know, in particular, I was very careful. I wanted to make sure it, like we had a trusted partner in this. And that's where Paul came in. And we started talking about it as like, okay, you know, I think I, the first thing probably out of my mouth was like, we need to make sure these projects line up. <laughs> they need to be a multidiscipline project. You know, we want to be able to show something that was realistic in nature um, that, yeah, like I said, multidiscipline, but also kind of could show off multiple things. So mixed use was really important. Um, you know, not just mixed use from an architecture point of view, but like mixed structural systems even, and that we could actually demonstrate the capabilities across the product as much as we possibly could, knowing that we couldn't probably show everything, but that we wanted to show as much as we could and have a realistic setting. Um, and that, it's not. Yeah, well, th really though, that, that you're getting slightly ahead there, because that first requirement, I think, was the, before we even started uh, talking ideas or specifics or anything like that. I, I remember you saying, I, you know, I almost don't care about anything else. It's just that these things need to line up. Like, cause the original model, it yeah. just didn't, it was, uh, you know, it was crazy. Like you try and link the MEP into the architecture and it just came in in the wrong right. spot. And what happened over all. the years, those you models, know? why we got into that state was those models were kind of piecemealed together over time. And that typically had been our sample models originally had been basically internal models that our QA teams or help team had created um, in order to help yeah. explain a tutorial or help show something. And they were really repurposed. So they were kind of piecemealed. We had old, we had at one point we had an old house that was our tutorial model that people could look at. And then we had the advanced school, technical school that was around for probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years, it feels like. And so I was on the team, that was the model. And it was, you know, put together, those models were put together for specific purposes of really around help and training. They weren't really trying to show like a real project. They were, you know, trying to get help people like navigate yeah. and be something that you could demo quickly. Um, and that was really kind of the difference in this undertaking was kind of setting it up as like, we wanted something that was more realistic um, and that actually somebody could say like, oh yeah, this could get you know constructed and, you know, could understand the industry best practices better. And then it was a better representation overall. But, so, yeah. so is this a real project? Right. No. <laughs> no, that's one of the um, big requirements I actually had too, which is more in the audit side. It's the legal thing, like trying to actually do a real building. Um, and when you're, you know, getting it out to however many people are going right. to use that version of Revit, uh, you know, real buildings are really difficult. Actually, the German sample model is a real project, um, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through around that and how distribution works mm -hmm. and how you have to make it a publicly available and just it, it actually made the project last, you know, go a lot longer. In fact, even though we'll get into this later, even though this project we started for a year and we we actually had a lot of community support because it's a real site with a real point cloud fall can show, um, it the, the the buildings actually were demolished. And so it was actually but even that process took us almost the entire year to get approval and get everything we needed to actually be able to provide the point cloud to everybody and look at it. And that was with no money exchanging hands or no, you know, like it was just the agreements in place to make that happen. Um, yeah, you know, early on when uh, even before we had a contract, you know, when Harlan first raised the idea to me, I already was anticipating a lot of the, you know, I've worked with Autodesk before and I know um, uh, that certainly there are, they are, what's the right the charitable way to put this? They're, uh, sure. they're very risk adverse, right? So legal, I knew was going to be a challenge. Um, so I was having some conversations with some potential partners that I might want to work with on this. And, um, my thought was, well, what if we, like, I went to some of my client firms and I said, well, what if we use the project that you guys did, but that never got built, you know, like, do you have anything like that, that you think your, your firm might want to share? And so I actually pursued that conversation for a little while, um, and ultimately, uh, pulled back on it, but that was that was my first thought on how to make it real ish, you know? So I think that's the joke we've been using is that this is real ish, right? Like we wanted it to be realistic and believable as a real project, 
and uh, anything that we could do real, which includes having a real site or using best practices, um, you know, a, a, adhering to building codes, even though we weren't required. I even I even have a buddy here in town who's um, the building inspector for my local town. And I went over with a set of drawings to his house one night and I said, here, I want you to just review this as if it was a real project and, and uh, just tell me everything that you see, you know, put your building inspector hat on and tell me what you see. He kind of gave me a, a free uh, building board review. So it was those kinds of things that we tried to do real. Um, but, you know, it's not real. We didn't have a budget. We didn't, the client is ordered us. There's two different sets of goals. There's the goal of creating a real-ish building, but there's also the goal of creating an exemplar uh, for Revit that shows new and seasoned users alike best practices in the product and how to use the product and how to get started with the product. So the goals that the project had were were multi and varied, and um, you know we had to find the balance. That, that's kind of the key word to this whole thing is trying to find the balance between those sometimes competing goals. You know, but then as Harlan was sort of alluding to, even just getting the permission to include this point cloud of a real site of buildings that no longer exist um, took nine, 10 months for to get through Autodesk Legal. So you can imagine what it would have taken if we had a real building. So did you <laughs> did you run this? Um, you know. Somebody designed this from, the, was there a program put together? Just, uh, is it that real-ish? Yeah. We, we had a team. Yeah, we had a team. So what, okay, so what's real is this? I'm here in recap and um, this point cloud exists and uh, a colleague of mine who works at a company called Case Technologies in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, they uh, do a lot of reality capture uh, for their clients. And so they had gone through, this is a town called Brownsville, Pennsylvania, and they went in and they scanned. And they were focused on this building uh, back here, this tall red building here, um, which is the old Union Station building in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. But in, um, and they were doing a sort of a community outreach project with that and involving the the local high school students and teaching them about technology and, and trying to uh, get some interest going and maybe even uh, resuscitating some of these buildings because a lot of these buildings in the downtown area are abandoned. And they happened to capture the whole street. And so he was showing this presentation to a group of us at one point, my friend was. And, um, you know, I kind of internalized this. And then months later, I'm talking to Harlan about this. And it dawned on me one day, I was like, hey, you know, Maybe that's the solution. So I called up my buddy and I said, hey, do you think uh, we could use that point cloud? And uh, he said, I don't see any reason why not. You know, I have to ask a few people, blah, blah, blah. I proposed the idea to Harlan. Harlan loved it. He started running it up the flagpole. And so again, the nine, 10 months started, but basically everybody loved the idea so that these buildings here are real historic structures that were there in Brownsville. And it turned out to be very fortuitous that this point cloud was taken when it was because about three months later parts of the building were falling into the street and sadly they had to be demolished so our concept was let's pretend an alternate reality let's pretend that the buildings didn't get demolished and instead imagine what would have happened if we had incorporated those existing facades and were able to save them and incorporated them into a new development and so that was kind of the the starting concept that we went to the architect with and said Here's our idea and our program is mixed use, you know, uh, let's do it. Let's, let's go from there. And I that's how the that whole thing started. Because the, so. so many projects are renovations or additions or adaptive reuse and to show off the capability of working with things that aren't perfect from the ground up from a blank page is a reality that so many architects and design professionals have to work with on a daily basis. And it just gives a more realistic sense of what that's actually like to have to do that because we we all do it all the time. Yeah, that I mean that's fundamentally why I got so excited about this as one of our you know one of our actually with an Autodesk and at the time renovation you know now makes up like fifty percent plus of new work that people are doing mm -hmm. and we hadn't shown that in any of our samples really they had all been new greenfield construction you know, blank flat sites or very simple sites. Right. And so the opportunity to right. do it that was exist. like, well, oh, this is huge. Yeah. This really is a great challenge. You know, I incorporated reality capture, um, you know, Paul's expertise too, with modeling these types of facades. I was like, oh, this is going to be really good because we're going to actually be able to show these things in a way that maybe we would, we would not have gotten the opportunity if we had not gotten that point cloud and not been able to do that. And like Paul said, it was, it's actually really difficult to get people to convince you to use their building 
Uh, like, because there's all sorts of concerns, right? There's like, you know, not only the yeah, legal or and, and, and this is a real location here, right? So it's got, um, you know, we've got a geo reference to that location in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. So it's that's kind of cool. You all so that part is definitely real. by their tourism, so. right? I'm sure people are going to flood, flood well, to Brownsville, right? <laughs> It's oh, funny, one of the reasons, uh, you know, the the not-for-profit we work for, the Perennial Project, actually agreed to this is because yeah. of that. So they actually, we have an agreement yeah. that allows them to promote sure. this and use this data set in their promotion and use it for their schools. To be famous, though. Um, you know, and show it off. We, me and Paul and, you know, half the product team kind of went and visited Brownsville and presented to their Chamber of Commerce, um, which was, you know, kind of a phenomenal story to be able to go back and, and talk about later. Like, hey, we did this thing and other people are going to be able to see this. So actually, I really valued that, too. I was like, okay, this is a great opportunity to take this former, you know, basically, what was it, a coal town in Pittsburgh, you know, right, right south, south of Pittsburgh, about an hour and really. Yeah, it's kind about of an hour uh, south of Pittsburgh. Yep. glad that you all were able to get this done, but it's like an example where. I can't see. Maybe there's something negative that could come from it. You know, if you look, if you're pessimistic, but it's like I don't see where there's any harm, right? It's like, look, this is great to be able to imagine this right. and share it with the world. Yeah, you never in these situations, you never know. Right. Right? Like somebody could have came out of the woodwork and been like, you know, this this facade was talked. Right. You know, I, I mean, we've seen weird sure. things like where somebody will be like, oh, I claim ownership over this little piece right. of that, and. You know, that's what that's you know one of the big considerations we had to avoid as part of this. But yeah, I mean, really, we didn't see that. We we think the risk was pretty low for buildings that no longer exist. It's tough for somebody to come back and say they own something that. So did so did you actually hire an architecture firm then to do? You gave them a program or basic program, and they developed this. Yeah. So my role was twofold in this project. Um, I was the project manager and responsible for things like assembling the team and, and coordinating everybody's efforts. And I also was the primary or really the only architectural modeler. So I did all the Revit architectural models. Um, the structure and the MEP models were done by the respective firms that I hired uh, for each of those. Now, I did interview some actual firms, but I decided for the most part, uh, and again, it was, it was a combination of... Um, what I thought would work better as a team, what I thought was more practical to kind of um, get things done in the very limited time frame that we had and the budget that we had and so forth. So I, I preferred to work with individuals kind of more working like um, almost like a, like a side hustle on this as opposed to actually hiring out a, a firm. Um, I did interview a few firms and we did talk about it that way. And some of them got the idea, some of them didn't. Some of them had a hard time with this idea, wait, you want me to do a real project, but not really? Uh, what about my liability? You know, like all that sort of stuff. And it was it was tough to try and convince some of them that you don't really have liability for something that not only isn't ever going to get right, built, right. but is not intended to ever get built, right? So there's really no liability there. So you can kind of, you know, it's it's um it's almost like the ideal project to work on because you're you're treating it as real as it can get without actually going that extra step. So anyway, for for a variety of reasons, we um I I hired mostly individuals. So for example, the architect is a retired uh, architect. He, he's got 50 years of, of experience in the industry. He's uh, from the Detroit area. He's got experience with um, uh, renovation work and uh, historic preservation work. Uh, you know, Detroit is very similar to the Pittsburgh area where there's a lot of these sort of um, older sort of uh, 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 areas that, uh, that need re restore, you know, restoration and so on. So he had experience with that. He he ran a firm for many years. Then he was the dean of an architecture school for several years after that. And then he was in retirement and I kind of pulled him out of retirement for, for this project. And we had a great time uh, working together on on uh, on the architectural side. Um, on the structural and the MEP side, I hired uh, experts in the industry similar to myself that were that are uh, very tied into the, uh, the Revit space, um, but also have... Uh, you know, uh, industry expertise. So uh, for structural, it was um, BD Mackey Consulting, which is uh, Desiree Mackey. She's the structural engineer. So she did all the calculations and the design of the actual structure. Brian Mackey did the the Revit modeling. Um, and then for MEP, it was uh, Steve Stafford's firm, AEC uh, Advantage or 
uh, yeah, AC Advantage. I, he changed the name of his company not too long ago. I want to make sure I'm not getting the wrong name there. Um, but uh, Steve Stafford is uh, uh, be, behind that. And um, so I had very competent people, both in Revit and in industry expertise, um, doing the, uh, the work. Um, and like I said, I did in some cases consider actually like one of the first MEP firms I, I uh, uh, interviewed was an actual MEP firm that I went and just kind of pitched the old idea to. And we, we, we did some back and forth, but ultimately we couldn't come to a term, a set of terms that really made sense. And then the next guy, uh, he didn't have availability for months, you know, and so it wouldn't fit our schedule. And then the next guy, he came on board, but it was... Um, uh, there was challenges with his schedule and he took it on and I let him join on, even though we both kind of knew it probably wasn't going to work out. And anyway, it kind of bombed out. And so he was actually like the fourth MEP firm that came on board. So the MEP was problematic from this day one. This is just like every um, but Steve other knocked it out of the park. Ever. This is exactly how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? And Harlan and I joked about that all the time because we were like, wow, it's like, it's even right. real down to this point, you know? Yeah, the so, MEP got, you know, at the very end, which was interesting. And I'm sure folks probably would find, like, clashes. I'm not going to be surprised that that happens. Um, oh, yeah. There, there's, it's not... No. It's, yeah, the architecture is the most far along, the structure very, very closely behind it. Because uh, uh, Brian and I were working together almost from day one. So the the structure and the architecture are very tightly coordinated Um but yeah, the MEP definitely. But again, what Steve was able to do in, we basically gave him a month and a half. I mean, he had like no time. Um, so I'm just, I'm still blown away to this day with how much he was able to do in such a short period of time. So he was a trooper. And my only regret is that I didn't hire him sooner. So, um, but we also had uh, civil consulting. Um, so uh, there was some work done in civil 3D and that's how we got the geo referenced uh, coordinates and so forth. We had a landscape architect who actually is also part of the perennial project. So uh, she did the green roof and she did the little park out in front of the building um, and uh, the, the residential lobby. She did some interior design there and we even hired a, a commercial kitchen uh, designer um, to uh, there's a small cafe in the front uh, in the first floor of the building. And so uh, we had that designed um, uh, professionally as well. So we, we brought in a lot of professional expertise because, again, we wanted that realism component. We wanted it to be believable um, in, so on that, know, in all those different areas. On that cover so sheet, you, don't look at the uh, you list the firms. Are those all fictitious then? They're not. Well, OK, so this was. Yeah, these are all these are the actual people. Um, there's a little bit of an Easter egg there, so I'm not going to. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you how to figure out. I kind of had given some of it away. So you already know who some of these people are. But um, uh, I asked everybody to come up with, Alter ego. Um, you <laughs> yeah. know, how they wanted to be referred. Yeah, they're, they're, alter, they're alter egos for this, right? Because early on, we weren't exactly sure whether we wanted sure. to go public with the team or not. Um, you know, again, there's there's a lot of people out there that, um, sometimes, you know, they're a little overzealous about sharing their opinions and they can be just mean and, and hurtful for no good reason. And like, I didn't, I was super proud of, and still am super proud of my team. The, the, what they did was fantastic. This, I am really proud of the result that we have here. And I didn't want to put anybody through a bunch of needless kind of nonsense. Now, fortunately, we've only had one or two negative comments that I'm aware of, and mostly it's been positive. So I'm really thrilled about that because you know, I was, I was bracing myself because, you know, I'm the kind of guy, I'll go speak at a conference like Autodesk University. I'll get a hundred comments. They're all glowing. Oh, love oh, Paul. One. It's great. Great session. Best one ever, blah, blah, blah. And then there's one that's hater right. and yeah. that's the only one that I need, that I see. It all the one I focus on. So I didn't want to put the team through that. Um, but uh, ultimately we kind of decided that maybe that was being a little silly and, you know, the team, they're all adults and they can decide for themselves if they wanted to have their name shared and so we've kind of since moved beyond that, but just the same. We still now we have this fun little um, alter ego stuff here on the on the cover sheet. So if people want to <laughs> take a stab at trying to figure out what all those That's things fun. mean, they can do it. But I'm not going to give you the I'm not going to fully give you yeah. the key there. It's more. And uh, this was an early thing too. you know, in Paul and I conversation about this, like how, how public do we want to be about the truth? Because like I said, I don't know. You know, we have we have our own reputation to do it, too. And sometimes the, uh, you know, the protection of the brand is, can be a good thing for people. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we, you know, gave that a little bit. Um, and also, you know, 
said that, hey, like, hey, this is an Autodesk thing. This is not their individual projects and make sure that that was okay for everybody. Right. Um, because it is. I mean, that's the way this works. So we want to make sure that we uh, take the blame when we need to. <laughs> It's at the point of view. And if you yeah. are unhappy, most of the decisions, like I said, are probably mine. Mm. Like if they don't do something and, mm. you know, because we had, we had set timelines by me, we had set, uh, you know, objectives, what we were trying to achieve and what we were going to show. And I did have to go back to Paul and say like, you know what? Nope. We're not going to do that. Paul. <laughs> like, because we don't have time. Yeah. Like we got to get this done. Um, and so yeah, there was a few things we had to pull back on it. You know, a project this scale and scope, if it was real, would probably be a two-year project, I would think, minimum. And we had essentially 10 months, you know, um, maybe a little more than that. But I mean, you know, we, there, there's a lot more we wanted to do. Um, and we just, you know, I mean, at some point, it just has to be penciled down, you know. Again, just like um, every architect and, out there. You know, despite that, I think uh, I think we came up with something pretty good. No, so cool. every, everything, oh, well, I don't for personally, I love having a richer model Again, for us, uh, probably very similar, Harlan, to what you described. It's like, we just need, because we don't produce, you know, projects in house, we just need stuff that we can chew on, test against it, you know, obviously demo against and yeah. those things. So from that standpoint, all smiles here and everybody that I've seen or talked to about it are, you know, thrilled that there's uh, that we don't have to use the old sample projects anymore that we've got something new. Yeah. I mean, that, that in and itself has made it worth it. Right. Like, and, and we see, you know, one of the things like you mentioned, like these sample models uh, for better or worse get used everywhere. Um, and they get used by non Revit. They get used by third parties, cloud, anybody, you know, we'll see them on competitor sites sometimes sure. about like, Oh, we can bring in a right yeah. model. So you're bringing in this. Right. Um, and so, you know, having that recent information and something that's fresh, and also, you know, that's a really important thing that I think, uh, you know, it had been a long yeah, time. I was going to ask how, long, how long were the like sample house and then the, uh, the, uh, commercial project. I don't even know what the name of it was. You know, if you use that sample house. So you know, I don't know exactly. I'm going to say at least folks are 20, 10 or 11 time frame or something. Probably. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's been a long time. I think as long as I've been using Revit. So that's at least 15, wow. 16 years. Long time. So. It's been a long time. I mean, the, and like I said, those models were, I think, yeah, I think it was bef either when we switched to the ribbon, like in 2010 yeah. or a little bit after maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe I mean, that's it. Yeah. Definitely not, that, I don't even remember what was yeah, there before the then. Technical school is not in Revit 1, I can tell yeah. you that. Well, I certainly don't remember what was there before. So as long as I can remember, it's been the technical school and the little, the little right. triangle house. Well, there's probably know. a lot of people out there that haven't even open 2024 it's only available in 2024 is that correct and was correct. it built in 2023 I would mostly um we had to um the last push was doing the site because we were naturally wanting to showcase uh, the new topo solid uh, functionality so the site started in 23 as a topography surface and uh we ended up replacing that with a topo solid we didn't uh we didn't just convert the existing one we kind of recreated it um, uh, in the end from, you know, to, as a topo solid, but, um, uh, uh, that, that obviously had to be done at the very end on a, on the, the most stable beta that we had. Um, but otherwise, mostly the model was built in 23 and, uh, it actually still exists privately in Autodesk construction cloud. Cause the, we did the whole thing in the cloud, um, with ACC and, um, you know, that's, uh, still available. The Autodesk team can uh, can still access it. It's still up there, um, and naturally, that doesn't have the the uh, the latest site because Topo Solid didn't exist in twenty three. So, um, and we haven't upgraded that one uh, to twenty four yet. And we can't really share uh, a cloud based project. There really isn't a way to just share that with the public, you know. So, um, so that's always going to be private. And but, it's um, it is a slightly uh, different version too because. Of you know, at the end of the cycle, it wasn't yeah. just the site. Like we ended up lots of QA review and lots, you know, we're making changes to make this thing work at the last right. minute. And so there's like content changes. There were lots of weird things that at the end were like, oh, we got to tweak this and change this. And so there's definitely a little async break that happened uh, when we did that. But yeah, and one of the reasons we did the construction cloud was 
know, again, like trying to simulate as much as possible, how would a, how would we actually work on this project and to take advantage of the tools, which is the other big thing I wanted, you know, from this is it, for me, it was the learning uh, opportunity as a PM. I'm always looking for ways to kind of learn about the process people are going through, even though I've gone through lots of projects and seen people's work before, you know, this wasn't new, but um, the chance to be able to actually have basically weekly contact with Paul, uh, where we were discussing what was going on and the challenges and issues he was running into was really helpful from uh, like, hey, okay, you know, we need to look at this for the future or need to consider how this is going to work. Um, and that was one of the other reasons why ACC was so valuable is to go through the process of actually using it. The, uh, um, I was going to ask, I know just from looking at it, um, that there's quite a bit of content in it that's, that is also the content library that ships with Revit. Was that in, was that a requirement to use all of that content or did you create any new content that is going to end up in the library because of that? Or can you talk about that? Yeah, I'll start, I'll start on the requirement side and Paul can answer the yeah. custom content side. So yeah, on the requirement side, I mean, initially, and if we can keep going on this and do more work, we intended uh, with all these previous sample models we did for Germany and Japan, we started with a sample model and then we built out the content library. Um, and so the, the, the starting of this project was, okay, let's start with a sample model, see how far we get, and then we can start updating the content library along with that. But initially we said, you know, I kind of, I gave him a, a kind of handcuff and I said, like, look, you know, if we can get away from not making all brand new content, um, that we, so can we use the stuff we already have as much as we can, that way we can update it later if we need to or whatever, but we don't have to do a lot of content changes because as you guys probably imagine translating, updating content is a whole nother thing, um, and creates a lot of extra time and energy to make it work and, and have things function correctly. So we really said like, look, let's try to use it. I said, let's use as much as we can with, you know, I let Paul decide how much extra he was going to put in on the content side because you know we had a fixed budget to try to work around on the project and spend on this just like a real project basically so right. you know kind of let all the side well, you know uh, but, yeah and and honestly i actually agreed with that um and so it was never i never treated that like a hindrance or a, or a problem like oh autodesk won't you know is he handcuffing me and won't let me do this i actually agreed with it wholeheartedly because if the if one of the main goals of this project is to showcase the capabilities of Revit, then uh, you don't do that by making the sample model be completely all custom, implying somehow that you can't do anything with what's provided, that you have to have all custom stuff. So I prefer instead to prove to people that you can do a very competent um, and professional project that doesn't have 100% custom families. Now, there are custom families in this project. Every project will have custom families. They have to, right? It's impossible to do. I mean, every project in architecture is unique in some way. So there will always be custom families. So again, it was a balancing, you know, uh, where does it make sense to do a custom family? Where can we get away with using an out-of-the-box family? Uh, and in some cases, maybe even just tweaking an out-of-the-box family. So there are some families which are just, light variations on out-of-the-box families. Uh, two that come to mind are the architectural columns that I used to wrap the structure. Um, I made a variation that had a parameter that could ship them laterally so that they could be off-center without having to be off the column grid. Um, but otherwise, they are just the out-of-the-box family. I just made that one small modification. Uh, and then, of course, on the historic facade, there's a bunch of windows that are not in the library. Um, well, I didn't want to reinvent the whole wheel and create entirely new windows. So all I did was take the out of the box window and where you needed a brick arch, uh, I just replaced the trim package that's around the out of the box window, which is just, you know, uh, boards and moldings. Right. And I just replaced that with an arch family. So it's using exactly the same family swapping in with a family types parameter that trims around, but the trim surround just happens to include a brick arch, you know? So I tried really hard to uh, uh, reuse, to use existing families as is, where I couldn't use them as is to do minor modifications that were practical and easy to implement. And then only then uh, create something totally custom. And I've, I've got a list here of some of the things. There are plenty um, of custom examples throughout the project. But um, even then I tried not to make them, you know, to get super carried away. And I, and I also 
projected that down to the team. And I did get some pushback, you know, if I'm being honest, from some of my uh, team members like, oh, but I've got my library and, you know, uh, it works so much better than the out of the box. And I'm like, that's true. But two things you need to keep in mind. Number one, uh, we're not providing a training manual with this. So your family might be great, but if nobody knows how to use it, it's not a great example. And number two, you're giving your family to Autodesk ownership you know, to, uh, lock and key, the whole thing, and it no longer belongs to you. So mm -hmm. you need to be okay with that. Oh, you know, those were the two criteria that I made sure they understood. And so any custom family they gave to me, they had to basically be signing it off and saying, it's okay that this gets shared with the world. And, yeah. um, you know, not everybody is willing to do that. So, um, you know, so those were some of the factors that came into play. So I, I think we found a good balance, but, um, there's still plenty so that, of custom content in yeah, here. And as you would say, all this custom content we did end up putting into the, like if you go to download the content and just it's, want it, you don't even have gotcha. to go to the project. It's, back right? in there. it's available gotcha. in the library. We went through that process. Well, uh, that's true of all the annotation content. I don't think some of these model elements made oh, it. Oh, right, there. right. If there was like um, a unique model thing, we didn't. But any of the annotation. Yeah, or, yeah like the stupper, for example, or the tree grade, I don't think those are in there. I mean, they could at some yeah. point, you could harvest those out, or certainly the trash chute. <laughs> Right. Like, I don't I don't expect that the trash shoot is in the library, but all of the um, all of the annotation content is I actually provided Harlan a complete folder that mirrored the existing structure. And the reason was I couldn't help myself. Uh, I went ahead and made the recommendation to change the font for the sample project. So I don't know if you noticed or not, but the font is not Arial in the sample project. So that meant all of the out of the box content needed to yeah, change. Not really. That was, that's probably the most controversial <laughs> thing, I think. <laughs> that we, we yes. agreed to do because we also we always, it was a totally unnecessary thing but we did so it we anyway. changed the font yeah. and we changed because of that you guys should know too that there's new templates that were provided as part of this so paul also built a new imperial uh, multi-discipline template as well as a metric multi-discipline template that when you start a new project you get the new font and so all the annotations work with that and change it that was probably the most controversial thing i think uh, reading about comments, it's like we, the, the old templates are still there. If you go to browse and go check them out there, you can yeah, still you get, can still get them. We simplified this a little bit as part of the project and kind of said, hey, we're going to do this multidiscipline thing, which of course, you know, that's controversial. Not everybody wants a multidiscipline project. They want architecture specific to their project type. Right. But we kind of decided we're going to simplify this and allow people, you know, a good starting point, knowing one of the big things, you know, in our research we've seen is that, like, you know, people are using their own templates. So we want to just say, if you're new, yeah. let's get you started with something that's better than the old, um, updated and refreshed as well, and based on the project we did, basically. I thought it was time to retire those little square elevation symbols that I, you know, that were invented by Revit. You won't see those in a CAD manual anywhere, so... Um, yeah, little, little things. I mean, you can take the boy out of architecture, right, but you right. can't take the architecture out of the boy, you know, like, uh, I was trained as an architect. I have an architectural degree. I worked, I've worked in the profession for 35 years. There are some things that I just, you know, can't let go of. And, uh, so uh, talk about, you haven't talked yet. about the uh, visualization component. Uh, what, who did that and what were you using the out of the box or this is twin motion. Um, and. Harlan, this was the folks at Twin Motion that did this Correct. rendering, right? Yeah. So while we were doing this project is when we were behind the scenes working with, on our Epic Games partnership. Um, and one of the things we wanted as part of that was to be able they needed sample models to be able to show off what we were working on. And so, again, sort of serendipitously, we were able to line everything up <laughs> across these multiple projects and yeah. say, okay. And then they took, so they took a version of the model. Not, again, probably not the final model, but very close. No, this was this was back in September, so we still had a few more versions to go. But very it, close. close. And then they they used their expertise uh, and created a Twin Motion project that um, is available for that in Twin Motion as well. So you can actually go check out the Twin Motion project and use this as their sample. Um, it's actually their splash screen for Twin Motion for Revit. They they got the cool thing to put a project on their splash screen, so they used the sample too. Um, yeah, and they they knocked that out of the park. I mean, they did things I think in promotion. I don't know how to yeah. do uh, with that with that sample, and really were able to get some good visualization. We showed off some some of these are in some of the videos we've posted, and you know, in, in other forums as well. You can go check this out. So, yeah, we we have a video that shows not only the. Uh some of the twin motion rendering, but some of the animations they did. And we can give you a link to that that you can include in the show notes. Um, 
it's it's up on YouTube, so you can just link to it and um, tell the story of Brownsville, and uh, you get to see a little bit of our field trip out there when uh, that Harlan was mentioning earlier. The visualization of the existing buildings is that from the point cloud data, or did they model those? Or no, I built a model of that. So, um, so we do have obviously, you know, the point cloud. You know, you're going to see, you know, it's it gets you to a certain to you know degree of of clarity here, right? But I've got I've got some images here that superimpose. So this is just the point cloud. And then here's kind of like a half and half, you know, so you can kind of see the point cloud over here on the right and the Revit model on the left. And then here's, you know, just the Revit model. So I worked right on top of the um of the point cloud and built a Revit facade model. And um, you know, for the bricks and the arches and everything, those I, I did pretty pretty close to what was there. I simplified in this facade in particular because, you know, even though I know I can create Corinthian columns, I mean, heck, I wrote a book on the subject, um, you know, so I, I know I could do that. I didn't feel it was necessary to have a full on Corinthian column there. Uh, so I did a much simpler rendition of it. Um, and likewise with, um, you know, some of these other pilasters up here, um, I did do, um, you know, a simplified version of an Ionic uh, there. And I did model, you know, this sort of elliptical arch here. So I did get some detail. But then um, further on, uh, we also took advantage here of the feature that it was, I was added, I think, in Revit 23, where you could start bringing um, OBJ files into Revit, fully textured OBJ files. So that OBJ file there that you saw in the little inset on the right there was generated from the point cloud or photogrammetry. I'm not sure which, but um, Case Technologies provided that little animation for us. And that was one of the actual keystones from the building after it was demolished. And uh, they did this, this reality capture of it. And uh, I incorporated that directly in the model. So if folks go to um, fine level of detail, so I'll just sort of open up the 3D view and show you this live. Um, and of course, the minute I said that now, let's see if... <laughs> if uh, Revit decides to do the classic, uh, I'm gonna crash because you're live thing, right? But um, there it is right there. You can see that um, uh, this view is saved in a fine level of detail. So you can kind of see that um, that OBJ model right there. If you switch to medium or coarse, that disappears and becomes, becomes something um, you know much simpler, right? So you can see it's just a, um, a really simplified uh, version in coarse and medium. And when you go to uh, find, it uses that nested OBJ. I only did that there just to show that it was possible. But, you know, if you add a lot of those, it starts to increase file size. And again, we were sensitive to people are going to download this. And, you know, uh, so we're trying to find that balance. But then, you know, here you can see this is very recognizable as an ionic column sure. capital, but it doesn't need to be more complicated than that because we weren't doing anything with that facade other than, you know, preserving it, basically saying this facade is going to stay uh, largely as is. But having said that, I did a ton of stuff on these facades. I mean, these are custom hatch patterns because the bricks that were used are a slightly different proportion than your standard common brick of today. You know, those are hundred year old bricks, right? These bands here, same thing, right? This is coarse level of detail. But when you go to fine level of detail, um, I swap out something a little bit more uh, complex in there. Uh, I've carved in with void geometry to kind of create some of these, you know, these brick reveals. And I built these corbels as a custom family there um, and then arrayed that across the facade. And, and of course, up here, um, you know, these like finials on the top, that's a custom family that uh, as are these dentals. So there definitely are custom families in use here. I've got this very elaborate balustrade up here, which is a railing. Um, that's a railing object. And so that kind of showcases that you can build very detailed railings if you want to. Uh, these bands are just using sweeps um, and then have the brick pattern applied to them. And then this is one of those windows I was talking about where, you know, if you tab through all of this, eventually I think we can get in there. No, I, there it is, right? So that act, that window, if you were to uh, actually edit that window family, um, there's a nested family that would be trim in the out-of-the-box window that I converted to this arch uh, here in this window. So I used the same mechanism that's being used in the out of the box window. And I just supplement it with, um, you know, with a nest, a different nested family. So it is largely um, just a save as version of the existing. Are you now going to use this Paul in your training as one of your primary training tools? 
Well, I already have started to. Um, it's tricky because, you know, you design your training program. Um, it's just funny you asked me that, right? So I was like, okay. Um, the the lazy side of you wants to say, I've already designed my training program and I, I know exactly what I'm covering and when and blah, blah, blah. So if I switch data sets, it kind of means I got to redesign the whole training program. But then I'm like, how bad would it be if, um, you know, people start hearing that I created the sample model and then I don't even use it right. in my own training. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Um, so I, I compromised this year. Uh, Revit Essential Training in LinkedIn Learning, I did not use the sample model. I show it uh, in one or two videos, but I did not use it as the basis of the uh, Revit Essential Training. Um, I, I, you know, that course is, is a 15 hour course. It takes me two weeks to record it every right. year. It's a big honking endeavor. So I just, I didn't have the time to redesign that whole course, but I did redesign entirely my learning Revit course. Um, now that one's late this year. Usually it comes out around the same time as essential training, but it should be coming out any day now, actually, uh, at the time of this recording. Um, but, uh, I finished recording that about a month and a half ago. So it's probably close to being done through editing right now. So I would say, uh, I expect that it will publish sometime in September, uh, here this year, uh, you know, currently, so any day now or up till the end of the month, maybe. And I redesigned that whole course and everything is done in the sample model in that course. And it seemed like an appropriate place to use it because learning is a shorter course and is intended to just kind of get somebody's appetite whetted on, on Revit to give them the essential functionality that, you know, like it's almost like an introducing Revit course, right? Like uh, here's the absolute basic basics that you need to start getting up and running with Revit. Um, in fact, at one point we used to call the course up and running and before they changed it to learning. Um, and so that seemed like an appropriate place to use the sample model. So I have been slowly incorporating it into my own training materials, yeah. but it takes some time to, to redesign those. Uh, well, lessons. you've got so, until 2035 yeah. when the next sample model <laughs> 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 right. to now begin incorporating. Yes. Hopefully Plenty it doesn't time, take right? that long yeah. for us to get. And, and by 2035, I'm kind of hoping I'll be retired by then, but, uh, you know, I have a question. Uh, Har maybe Harlan, we could start with you, and, and then Paul, you can add in as well. But what what to you is the most interesting or most your favorite part of not not just the output of the project, but the process as well? If you could pick one or two things from that that really stand out to you, creating this and then releasing it. Yeah, I have two. Um kind of interesting ones that I would call as kind of my favorite pieces. And part of, part of this is about process for sure. Um, part of it's just about the kind of what we were able to pull off. Um, so the first one, and maybe Paul will, will say these are, this is his as well, I bet. Um, the bandstand to start with um, was one of my, one of the favorite kind of stories in this project. So uh, from the beginning, I thought, oh, you know, we should have a green roof. So one of the Autodesk things is sustainability is such an important part of in the world. And you know, trying to make the world a better place is really our mission. And so like, I'm like, well, we have to be able to do some sustainability work in a green roof in a downtown area, you know, in Brownsville, we're facing a river. I'm like, we should totally do something, some entertainment space on the roof as part of this. And Paul was like, oh yeah, we should do that. So early on, um, we were thinking about it facing the river and like it was this, you know, like, oh, yeah, that'll be perfect. You know, you could have music up there. People would enjoy the the outdoor space and we'd have this nice green roof. Um, and so we talked to the perennial project a little bit and we said, hey, you know, we're, we're thinking about this thing. What do you guys think? Would this be good for the area? I'm kind of doing a little bit of early discovery. And uh, what Joe, I can't think of Joe's last name, Baron uh, Tovich, who kind of is in one of the videos and the main guy for the perennial project sent us these historic photos of basically this bandstand on the street side. Oh, wow. And we're like, oh my God, like, this is great. And at some point right. it was torn down. And so we're like, well, we should try to, right. you know, give a nod to the history here and do the same thing. Um, and so, you know, we basically worked there and Paul redesigned the roof and basically to have this bandstand facing the street, which was awesome. I'm sure Paul can add more to that. But the second story is the parking garage. Um, <laughs> So again, like we we're trying to show off basically, you know, Revit's capabilities as a big part of this and show people what it can do. And we were at the same time working on developing our new Topo solid functionality. Revit site tools get a lot of criticism and have for a long time. 
And we were in the in process of our, we're in this major change around solid topography, letting people cut holes to underground structures. And so I told Paul, I'm like, you know, we, we really need to show on something underground. I'm like, can we do a parking garage? Um, and, you know, the structural engineers, Brian and Desiree, were not really happy about this change. Uh, given that <laughs> they said, do you know the hydrostatic pressure? You're being 20 feet from a river. Do you have any idea? They were but- not, you know, not really on board. But, you know, this is an example here of like, hey, we were able to design a usable parking garage under the building and take advantage of a, of a existing parking lot across the street for the entry. So, you know, it's pretty unrealistic. You're driving under the road. We have no idea what's under that road. Um, so like, yeah. you know, the, the, and the head clearance, you know, maybe you could drive under it. Like maybe we'd have enough. But, you know, this example of like, hey, you can now do this in Revit. Um, you can start to design these types of ramps and tunnels and actually do it in a way that makes sense. Um, to a certain extent, mm-hmm. uh, you know, was a really valuable thing from a project point of view, especially when we're launching a new capability. So normally when we've done these in the past, it, you know, it's really hard to do a sample model develop as you're building functionality because the functionality is not done, not ready to be modeled until we really release it. Um, so the fact that we were able to pull that off um, and actually make it work was hugely beneficial for the launch of that feature, but also, you know, I think for this project in particular, to kind of show that. Yeah, um, I love both of those, Harlan, and I guess I'll just add one or two tidbits to your uh, your bandstand. We included these historic photos on the cover sheet, and one of the things I always like to uh, to kind of point out here is that this main building here, which I guess used to be the headquarters of, Mono- of the Monagahela Bank, um, which uh, is right there in Brownsville. It, you know, it started off as a pretty modest, well, modest. I mean, it had a pretty detailed facade, but it was um, only this two-story. And then at some point it grew to this three-story. And then at some point it had the bandstand. And then the bandstand went away at one point. And, um, and then this lower facade actually got removed at one point and moved down the street to the, become the facade of the public library. So this building got transformed so many times. And so this idea that we could somehow, um, in our story that we were crafting, that we could somehow be part of that and say, hey, let's restore this building to what it once was and put the bandstand there. It just seemed so, it, it was like this gift that fell in our lap that um, just seemed perfect for what we were trying to achieve with the project. So um, I echo everything Har- Harlan said, and I love that. And I love the fact that we were also able to uh, incorporate design options uh, into that uh, design. So you can see that the one in the twin motion is a little different than the one that's here. Well, we left them all in and um, you can go to uh, design options in the model. They're still there, right? So the different options are, are are available and you can switch between them. So that was one of those things where, you know, I don't think any of the existing sample models used design options. And so we were trying to showcase some of those uh, features that are very popular in Revit, but that often don't have any good examples. Um, I guess what I would add was my two things are... Um, what was the actual coordination, the weekly meetings with Harlan? Because, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, on the very selfish side, you know, as somebody in my line of work who's a consultant um, uh, and working with client firms every day, you be able to have uh, a meeting every day with the product manager for, you know, or, or every week with the product manager of Revit. That's, that's kind of a cool privileged position to be in. So I definitely was jazzed about that, being able to have this sort of direct line and Hey, Harlan, do you know that this doesn't work? Or did you know that there's this problem with this piece of content? And, you know, and he was always very receptive to all those suggestions along the way. But if I can actually admit something, um, I've got, like I said, about 35 years of experience in the architectural industry, but um, most of my experience is either as a uh, person, as a member of a project team, or as an outside consultant in the, obviously the last 20 years or so. Um, but when I was practicing architecture, it was always as a member of a team. I never actually was a project manager. This was, believe it or not, the first time that I actually did the role of project manager. And um, I learned a ton through the process uh, of just what it takes to kind of keep all those balls in the air and keep everybody moving along and, you know, uh, sometimes work with competing um, uh, challenges and competing goals and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It was really... Um, it, it was it was really powerful for me to, to go through that process. So I really enjoyed that. Um, as far as in the model, I mean, there's so many things I like in this model, but I think one of the things that I like the best is the stairs. Um, so uh, 
I'm going to show this live, hopefully, if I don't um, uh, mess that up. But um, I've got a uh, sheet view here, which has some uh, cutaways of the stairs. And um, the biggest challenge here was, as we said, with a real site, we had real site problems. And um, I can show that a little better with a diagram here, and then I'll go back to the live model. Um, but uh, there is a six foot drop in elevation uh, from one side of the site to the next. And um, that means that uh, each stair tower was very different on its first two floors. Um, and so that was one challenge. And then of course, you know, anybody who's used Revit before knows that stairs are often a place where people, you know, uh, have comments. That's very that can be charitable. Way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have every. A, they, I mean, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't. I mean, I can't count the number of conversations I've had to have about stairs and the things that you know, we need. Yeah, but it I'm was sure. super. I mean, from my point of view too, like this was all again another opportunity to kind of hear that feedback and and be able to, you know, kind of get a better understanding of some of these issues. Right. So these stairs, I tried to build them. Uh, they are live rivet stairs. I tried to build them uh, as close as possible to meeting um, international building code as as I understood or as I could. Now, again, um, somebody who does stairs every day for a living in an architectural firm might find issues with what I built, but um, and I fully expect that. But I I I think I got pretty close. Um, you know, the stairs, the railings, um, and then. Uh, for the intermediate landings that, of course, can't be part of the stair, or they could be, but just not well, um, I just created a series of floors and um, and slab edges to simulate. And then you've got these other, uh, you know, kind of chunks of railing, which connect the pieces in between. So I was trying to show people, you know, sometimes people get really upset that they can't do it the way that their intuition tells them that they should be able to do it. Like, theoretically, you should be able to have one continuous rail that goes up the entire building. Okay, sure, I get that. But you know, in reality, it won't be one continuous rail. Yeah. They'll build it in pieces and weld them together and so forth. So there's that. And um, secondly, it's just not going to work that way in Revit. So you can be upset and grind your teeth and, you know, rend your clothing about how come it's not working. Or you can find a solution that gets you where you need to go that that is an acceptable alternative. And I think what we're showcasing here is an acceptable alternative. And so I I really was happy to have the opportunity to be able to showcase that in not just some silly little stair that goes up two floors that are exactly the same. No, there's only two levels in this whole building that have the same floor to floor height. So um, I think it's right here, okay, where the, we've got the same floor to floor heights, but this one, second floor is completely unique. First floor is completely unique. Going up to the roof is completely unique. So um, it's a much more real stair in that sense that what people are really dealing with and yet trying to come up with a way uh, to to model something that is quite acceptable for all of those conditions and make it work. Um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of what we yeah. were able to and come I up also with love the, uh, the fact that again, our structural engineer, the real collaboration that was taking place, the initial design, like they, they did not like. <laughs> they did not like. And we like, had a lot yeah. of back and forth. Yeah. They were like, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, uh, there was lots of conversations with Desiree where she was just scratching her head saying, what are you trying to do here? Do you realize that, you know, you've got your thing floating and I'm going to have to put a big beam there and, you know, blah, you know, like all this stuff. Right. And then me playing the role of the architect, what are you talking about? You mean you can't just cantilever that or, you know, like all that silly stuff. But, um, yeah, this was the early design, which worked from a floor plan point of view, maybe a little bit better, but just did not work overall. So going through those collaborations with the structural and back and forth and then doing the redesign, going back to the architect, uh, there was, it was truly a collaborative process between, you know, with myself in the middle, the architect on one side, the structural engineer in the other, you know, Harlan uh, kind of lateral to all of that. And just all of us going back and forth and coming up with uh, a solution in the end that I think was superior to anything that we started with and wouldn't have been possible without everybody's input. So um, really a truly real project experience from that point of view. Well, guys, thanks for uh, sharing some of this backstory on this. I'm, uh, as I said, it's relatively new into the market, so I'm, I'm sure not everybody's been able to open it up and take a look at it yet. But uh, over the coming few months, I'm sure it's going to be in more and more hands. So being able to hear how this came about, it's uh, I'm sure going to be interesting to a lot of people. So thanks for sharing.
Well, I hope so. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. And we welcome all feedback. So, That's great. Um, you know. Evan, any last comments or questions? I'm just really happy to hear the depth at which all of this kind of came together and the the seriousness that you all applied to the project because I think a lot of people when they open up the program they they want to look for an example uh, and it may not directly apply to what they're doing but they can then reverse engineer it maybe and learn something and I think with a project like this it takes real world constraints into uh, consideration helps tell those stories so that people can figure those things out hopefully on their own much better than searching endless web forums on you know how you know how to find something and and eight people tell you eight different ways to do it at least here is a real live model that people can dig into and copy and paste things out of if they wanted to and and actually just see how you approached solving some of these real world problems that again architects and engineers and consultants deal with this kind of stuff all the time. And it's it's really cool to hear that you went through that very similar process to accomplish that goal. And I, I'm, I'm really happy also to hear that you're getting great feedback on it, that it's mostly positive because obviously it was a lot of work and it took a, a big risk for you to even, you didn't have to do this. It's just, it's great that you did. Well, I'm so glad to hear all of those comments. I mean, I, I think it's gratifying to me to, to see that you, that, you, that you captured all that nuance. That's exactly what we were trying to do. So awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I was joking. No, not joking. Uh, I was really serious. I was talking to some of our team members, and I, um, I think I even posted this on LinkedIn at one point. Like in all my years at Autodesk and doing projects and doing features and development, like I've done a lot of things. Like not to too much, or too much. A lot of different features. Some people, some things people have loved. Some things people have hated. I'll you know throw out the whole gauntlet there. Um, this was one project I was really really proud of uh, because of the team we had involved, a bunch of great people, the fact that, you know, it not only included Paul and all the consultants, but our own Autodesk side too, our QA teams were involved. Like we had to do a lot of testing and validation and it was really a, a massive group, group effort. And I think the results were really phenomenal. Like we, I think, you know, it's not perfect. And actually me and Paul talked about that too. Like it was never going to be perfect. We didn't set out to have it be perfect. We set out to have it be realistic yeah. and have it be kind of representational. And um, like at the end of the day, I was like, wow, this is this has been a great thing for us to do. And even if people, some people might think we should have gone farther or done something different, that's okay. Cause that's part of the process. So, you know, nobody's ever happy with every building that's up. But there's always stuff. Somebody yeah, can look sure. at it and say, oh, I would have done that differently if I was in charge. And and I think it gives people enough of yeah. that to put themselves in those shoes, hopefully, and, and you know, be able to see that, yes, like, hey, I can do that, too. I, have a, I know what our next episode is going to be. Steve Stafford, Brian and Desiree Mackey to get the real story <laughs> by the, <laughs> of what this looked like. I love it. Uh. No, what, right, a, what a great! I'd love to yeah, hear what they have to I'll, say. I'll definitely be watching and listening. <laughs> a great, to uh, a great team of people that you put together to do it, and uh, I, I, I'm sure the the world. Right, there's obviously a lot of people that use Revit around the world, and it's going to touch a lot of people over you know the coming months and years that they'll be able to use this. So, again, uh, kudos to you all to put put this together, and much appreciated. And to those people, I'm sorry, <laughs> it is an Imperial <laughs> units. But that's what mostly we use here in the U.S. Well, it, it is the project would have been in the U.S. Sure. So that made sense to me. Right. It's in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. They use yeah. beaten inches. I, I'm there. guessing you've I'm heard sorry. that as feedback already. So. <laughs> oh, I mean that's that's always feedback. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's always feedback. But hey, look, for twenty something years we had the technical school in meters for a U.S. sample model. I think you know we. Uh, you know, it's, it's fine for us yeah. to nice. go the other well, way. Thanks again, while. guys. We really appreciate coming on, uh, sharing the story. This is this is what we want this podcast to be about: is getting this kind of behind the scenes uh, a look at how all this kind of stuff comes together and how how the how these things are made and the teams that are put together and the thought that goes into them and the the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, it's uh, it's the way uh, the world is, right? So, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Thanks for having us.